皆様こんにちはただいまより同志社大学一神教学祭研究主催の公開講演会キリスト教出現に対するユダヤ人の反応と題して今日は講演の時をお持ちしますすでに昨日もお越しになった方がおられるかもしれませんけれども今日の講演会とですね私たちがこういったテーマを企画いたしました趣旨について簡単に説明をさせていただきたいと思います私はあの本日司会進行を務めさせていただきます一神教学祭研究センター長の小原克弘です昨日と今日と2回の公開講演会を私たちは企画いたしましたこれは実はですねこの公開講演会と並行いたしましてユダ,ヤユダヤ学会議というですね、まあ、あの催し行事をですね私たちは行っていますこれが今年度第5回目を迎えるんですけれども私たちは通常、まあ、一神教ユダヤ教キリスト教イスラムの比較研究あるいは相互のですね対話を行っておりますがこのユダヤ学会議においては特にユダヤ教に焦点を当てて、えーまあ、様々なですね、講師を招きして研究を深めてまいりました。その中でですね、海外からお越しいただきましたお二人の先生に、ただ研究者向けのですね、話をしていただくだけではなくって、その知見を一般の方々にも披露し、このユダヤ教のですね、課題を広く共有したいというのが私たちの思いとしてあります。で本日お招きいたしましたピーター・シェーファー先生は、アメリカのプリンストン大学で教鞭を取っておられる先生です。まあ、ご専門は文字通りユダヤ教、ユダヤ学でありますけれども、今日はですね、そのユダヤ教とキリスト教の関係、特にそのキリスト教が現れたときにですね、ユダヤ人たちがどのようにまあそれに対して反応したのかということが。今日のテーマになりますのでまさにそのユダヤキリスト教のですね出自に関わるようなそういったお話を聞けるのではないかなというふうに思っておりますでこれまでですね私たちはユダヤ教を中心としましたユダヤ学会議を、まあ、今回第5回目を迎えるんですけれどもこの前のですね受付のところに第4回ユダヤ学会議昨年行われた会議の報告書がですねすでに刊行され出てますのでもしまだお持ちの方がまだお持ちでない方はですね自由にそれを取ってまたご覧いただければというふうに思いますカウンターのところに置いておりますのでそういった刊行物を通じてユダヤ教についてのですね学問の状況などを知っていただければというふうに願っておりますそれではあのこれからあの先生にですねお話を始めていただきます前に同志社大学進学部長の水谷誠先生より一言挨拶をいただきます。進学部の水谷でございます。本日はこの公開講演会にお越しいただきまして日曜日でありますけれども。わざわざお越しいただきまして誠にありがとうございます感謝申し上げます、えー、最初にのまあ、小原先生小原所長から少しシェーファー先生についてのご案内がございましたけれどもあのシェーファー先生ご紹介申し上げてそして、えー、公開講演会のあのに入りたいと存じます先生はあの今ご紹介ございましたようにプリンストン大学におけるユダヤ研究並びに宗教学の教授として、えー、活動をしておられます。現在はその大学におけるユダヤ研究を統括する立場にいらっしゃる方でございます。でただあの今はアメリカのプリンストンでありますけれどもあの本来はドイツにお生まれになって長くドイツの大学で教えになりました。えー、ベルリン自由大学というところで四半世紀にわたってあの教鞭を取りになりそして定年で退職後あのプリンストン大学にもっぱらそこで活動を続けておられますベルリン自由大学といいますのはあの東西冷戦の時代にベルリンが東ベルリンと西ベルリンに分かれましたでその時にあの昔からございましたベルリンにフンボルト大学という有名な大学がございますがあのそこが東ベルリンに属していたために西ベルリンでまあ、その知的財産を継承発展させるためということで
設立された大学はベルリン自由大学でございます。そこでもイデア研究において非常に顕著な功績を残されましたで今までにあのドイツではのあの、まあ、これは人文系の学問にとどまらず社会自然科学系の学問についての、まあ、ドイツ最高の褒章といいますかあの17世紀の,あの有名な偉大な哲学思想家であるライプニッツという人の名前を取りましたライプニッツ賞というものを受賞なさっておられます。そしてまたアメリカでもこれ人文系の,あの最もあの評価の高い栄誉であるところのメロン賞と言われる賞をあの受賞しておられましてでまあ共にあの非常にあの多くの研究助成を受ける賞でございます褒賞でございますで億単位あのまあそういう学の中で先生は研究をお勧めになりまた更新のの指導をなさってきたのでございますで現在はあのブリティッシュアカデミーであるとかベルリン・ブランデムルクアカデミー学術アカデミーですねあるいはイスラエルのアカデミーなどの,あのメンバーとしてあの国際的に活躍しておられますで古代並びに中世初期におけるユダヤ研究の第一人者あのとして知られておりまして、えーまあ、最近のユダヤ研究の再活性化に顕著な働きをしておられる方でございます。本日のあのユダヤ教とキリスト教との関係に関わる講演でありますけれども、あの最近先生がお出しになりました。非常にあの非常に興味深いテーマのあの著作がございます。これは昨年でありますけれども、キリスト教の精神に基づくユダヤ教の誕生。通常あのキリスト教はユダヤ教から生まれたというふうに考えられるのでありますけれどもこれはそのちょっと逆の発想で、えー、それ以降の、まあ、キリスト教以降のユダヤ教について案内をなさった書物でありますどうぞあのあの興味深い講演であると思いますので最後までよろしくご清聴をお願いいたしますThat I am、uh, not only g i v e a lecture in Japan, but also that I am in Japan. So, and I must say, I am overwhelmed by the wonderful、uh, hospitality、uh, that has been、uh, showered upon me、uh, since I am here. I arrived yesterday. I'm still pretty much jet lagged, but I did uh, um, see and I did uh, um, enjoy the wonderful hospitality. Of my host and the people I have seen so far here at this wonderful university. Now I will be sitting down.、Uh, yes, let us, I will be sitting down. And before I start, one last remark. The lecture I'm going to give today is a kind of preview of、uh, my new book that will appear next year with the Princeton University Press, which has the, I believe, quite striking title The Jewish Jesus. How Judaism and Christianity shaped each other. Okay, now I begin with my lecture. Common wisdom, common belief has it that、uh, the belief in the unity and the uniqueness of God has been one of the firmly established principles of Jewish faith, faith since time immemorial. This belief is considered. To be forever recorded in the solemn beginning of the biblical Shema, one of the daily prayers in Jewish worship. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, in Hebrew, Adonai Echad. And since the latter part of this declaration can also be translated as the Lord is one, it contains in Nutsche an acknowledgement of Israel's God. As the one and only God, 
with no other gods beside him and is simultaneously a recognition of him as the one and undivided God that is not consisting of multiple personalities. This peculiar character, stop here, shall we stop here? Or? <clears throat> this peculiar character of the Jewish God is generally except cut captured under the rubric monotheism, although the view is becoming ever more accepted that such a category is highly problematic for the biblical period, let alone for those periods coming after the closure of the Hebrew Bible. The authors of the Hebrew Bible no doubt tried very hard to implement and enforce the belief in the one God in its double sense, but they also faced considerable resistance and were constantly fighting off, fighting off attempts to thwart their efforts and to sneak in ideas that ran counter to any strict interpretation of monotheism. Thus it appears that the very notion of monotheism as a monolithic and stable entity is misleading and that we need to distinguish between the rigid and programmatic rhetoric of monotheism as opposed to its much less rigorous practice. The rabbis of the Talmudic period after 70 CE encountered an even more complex environment. Regardless of how much they assumed and insisted on their God's unity and uniqueness, they were surrounded by people for whom such an idea was highly contested territory. The Greeks and Romans were amazed by the claim of a God reserved solely for the Jews. And this exclusivity underscored by the Jewish God's strict and iconic character and a complete lack of images depicting him. The well-meaning among them nevertheless tried to integrate this elusive God into their pantheon as some form of summum deum, highest God or highest heaven, whereas the mean-spirited among them parodied the Jewish beliefs or plainly concluded that the Jews must have been the worst of all atheists. And <coughs> the emerging Christian sect set out to elaborate the notion that the one and only God in terms uh, first of a Binitarian and then a Trinitarian theology. That is, they took the decisive step to include God's Son in the Godhead, later followed by the inclusion of the third divine figure, the Holy Spirit. And the various groups that are commonly subsumed under the label Gnosis embraced the Neoplatonic distinction between the absolutely and uniquely transcendent God the first and highest principle, and the demiurge, the second principle, responsible for the mundane creation, which could easily and derog derogatorily be identified with the Jewish creator, God. Ed. And the rabbis were certainly aware of such developments, the rabbis of rabbinic Judaism, and responded to them. The rabbinic literature has preserved a wealth of sources that portray the rabbis as engaged in a dialogue or rather debate with people who present views that run counter to the accepted or imagined rabbinic norm system. Generally, these dialogue partners, commonly subsumed under the category minim, that means all kinds of beliefs, people with divergent beliefs, are presented as opponents whose ideas need to be refuted and warded off, hence the customary translation of minim as heretics. It goes without saying that these heretics did not escape the attention of modern scholarly research, which from its inception was focused on, if not outright obsessed with, identifying this elusive group of people that caused the rabbis so much trouble. The respective sources have been collected and exhaustively analyzed, more often than not, with the explicit goal of identifying the one particular and peculiar heretical sect behind each and every individual source. 
In other words, it was the implicit and unquestioned assumption of most of the relevant scholarship that within the wide spectrum of rabbinic sources, we are indeed dealing with clearly defined boundaries between what was regarded as an accepted set of ideas and what was not regarded as such, hence with the boundaries between orthodoxy on the one hand and heresy on the other hand, and that almost all the varieties of heresies can in fact be identified as belonging to this or that clearly defined heretical group. Yes? Uh, I will just mention uh, the most important scholarly work on this problem that is the following paragraph, Daniel Boyarin. Yeah? Daniel Boyarin, in his quite famous book, Borderlines, the Partition of Judeo-Christianity, has repeatedly, uh, repeatedly and forcefully maintains that not only is the effort to identify the various heretical sects a vain one, moreover, and more importantly, he holds that there were no such heretical groups as well-defined entities, distinct from the rabbis. In fact, when exposed to Christian ideas in particular, the rabbis were arguing not against an enemy from the outside, but rather from within, that is, against their own colleagues who seemed unduly impressed with certain Christian views. He even goes so far as to suggest that we regard Christianity not as a sect, within ancient Judaism against which the rabbis fought, but as an integral part of the rabbinic mindset. Much as I agree with the proposition, that is, no well-defined heretical sects as opposed to rabbinic Judaism, I believe that Boyarin grossly overshoots the mark with respect to the conclusions he draws. In his desire, to integrate Christianity into rabbinic Judaism, he in fact blurs the boundaries and cavalierly disregards chronological and geographical, that is Palestinian versus Babylonian, distinctions. And this becoming particularly obvious in his dealing with the Enoch Metatron traditions to which I will refer in a moment. But still, Boyarin has opened a window and allowed a fresh breeze to reinvigorate the scholarly debate about the minim. Indeed, it remains an important question as to what extent the rabbis were active partner in these discussions with the minim, that is, whether our rabbinic sources only reflect the fending off and repulse of such heretical prop propositions, or whether they reveal hints that the, or rather some rabbis, were actively engaged in expanding the borderlines and in softening the all too rigid idea of the one and only God. And phrased this way, the question does not assume that the discussions preserved in our rabbinic sources reflect the controversy of firmly established religions, Jewish, pagan, pagan Christian, Gnostics, or what else, but allow for still fluid boundaries it within and beyond which a variety of groups were competing with each other in shaping their respective identities. From this follows of necessi necessity that the rabbis in arguing against heretics were not always and automatically quarreling with enemies from the outside, but also with enemies from within, that is, with colleagues who entertained ideas that the rabbis were fighting against. In what follows, I will present one example of, for the rabbis' discussions with the heretics. In so doing, I will indeed start with the assumption that the boundaries between orthodoxy and heresy have been fluid for a long time, or, to put it differently, that the impact of the various heresies was crucial for the rabbis in shaping their own identity. With regard to the heresies, a picture is about to emerge that is much more diffuse than has been previously thought. 
with fluid boundaries with even between the heretical groups and sects, and that renders fruitless any attempt to delineate these boundaries more sharply. Yet it seems safe to say that the main opponents of the rabbis were pagans on the one hand, that is Greco-Roman polytheism, and Christians on the other, again in all its heretical variety, and with its own struggle to identify its identity. This means that whereas the emerging Christianity defined itself by making recourse to contemporary Judaism, as well as to all kinds of groups and movements within itself, the emerging rabbinic Judaism defined itself by making recourse to Christianity as well as to all kinds of groups and movements within itself. To be more precise, even the phrase within itself is ultimately misleading, since this itself, far from being a stable entity, is the unknown quantity that we aim to describe. In other words, the paradigm of our unknown quantity is in constant flux and not always the same. That is, not always e either a straight Judaism or a straight Christianity. Depending on the context, it sometimes is Christianity and sometimes it is inside Judaism, with the inside and outside categories becoming ever more blurred. Okay, and I will skip the next paragraph again. And I will come now to my concrete example. I had, uh, in fact, two examples. And for the constraints of time, I skip one example and will focus only on one, uh, but I believe very important example, and that is the example of Metatron. Yes. Metatron, I will explain the name later. We know, all you know, I believe, I hope, of the patriarch Enoch from the bibl biblical book of Genesis. Unlike the other patriarchs before him or after him, our poor Metatron, uh, Enoch, 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 lived only, only 365 years. And the Bible doesn't explain why. The Bible just says, I quote now Genesis chapter 5, 21 to 24, and Enoch lived 60 and 5 years, and he begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That means Enoch's life was apparently terminated because God took him. That's what the Bible says. But why did God take him? While the Hebrew Bible doesn't answer this question, he just disappeared, the post-biblical Enoch literature tries to give an answer. It takes the phrase, God, Enoch walked with God, literally, by arguing that God wanted him to be with him. And since God doesn't walk on earth any longer, Enoch must have ascended to heaven and stayed with God in heaven. And this is what we learn from the first Ethiopic book of Enoch, that is the Book of the Watchers, which dates from the late 3rd century BCE, and from the similitudes or the parables of Enoch, another book that dates from the late 1st century BCE, and the second Slavonic Book of Enoch, 1st century CE. In order to stay with God in heaven, Enoch needed to be transformed into an angel. And the same is true for the much later third book, of the Hebrew book of Enoch, the third Enoch, which most likely dates from the post-Talmudic period, that is somewhere between the 7th and 9th century CE. 
that the third, the Hebrew, the third book of Enoch goes much further than any of its predecessors. There, in the Hebrew book of Enoch, Enoch ascends to heaven, is transformed into an angel, and stays with God. Yet this transformation is unheard of before. When Enoch appears in the highest heaven, the angels oppose the presence of one born of a woman, because he is human, among them, but God explains to them that this particular human being is, quote, the choicest of all, and that he is destined to serve God's throne of glory. Before Enoch can begin his service, he first gets a new name, Metatron. That's the name Metatron. Metatron probably meaning the one sitting next to the throne of God. And then a process of transformation needs to take place, which is described in great detail. He is infused with divine wisdom, enlarged and increased in size to enormous, huge dimensions, and equipped with 72 wings and 365,000 eyes. And then God provides him with a throne similar to his own throne of glory, placed at the entrance of the seventh heaven or palace, and has a herald announce that he is appointed God's servant as prince and ruler over all the heavenly forces. All the angels and princes of heaven are admonished, admonished and I quote now from this book, any angel and any prince who has anything to say in my, that is God's presence, should go before him and speak to him. Whatever he says to you in my name, you must observe and do. So Metatron becomes God's representative in heaven, his dep deputy and second in charge. Since he understands not only all the secrets of creation, but also the thoughts of men's hearts, we might even conclude that not only the angels, but also human beings are well advised to turn to him as the deputy and representative of God. And his transformation not yet finished, God fashions for him a majestic robe and a kingly crown and calls him his, I quote from Third Enoch, lesser Adonai, Adonai or Yahweh Hakatan, the little the lesser God, because it is written in Exodus chapter 23, my name is in him. Let's first translate this because this is the most important part of my whole lecture. And then God inscribes on Metatron's crown the letters by which heaven and earth were created. And all the angels in heaven fall prostrate when they see his majesty and splendor. And then comes the ultimate transformation, and I quote now from the third book of Enoch. At once my, Metatron's, flesh turned to flame, my sinews to blazing fire, my bones to juniper coals, my eyelashes to lightning flashes, my eyeballs to fiery torches, the hairs of my head to hot flames, all my limbs to wings of burning fire, and the trunk of my body to blazing fire. In order to be transformed from the human being Enoch into Metatron, the highest angel in heaven, Enoch's human existence must be annihilated and turned into an angelic being of fiery substance. This procedure is reminiscent of what we are told in the first and second book of Enoch, but in none of these earlier books does an angel come as close to God, not just in distance, but also in his physical appearance and his rank, as does Metatron in three Enoch. He is enthroned almost like God. He looks almost like God. He has almost the same name as God. He knows all the heavenly and earthly secrets, including the thoughts of human beings. And he is worshiped almost like God. In some, he is the perfect viceroy who acts on behalf of God 
and to, him, and to whom God has given unlimited power. The rabbis perceived such an unprecedented elevation of a human being as dangerous and could not leave it uncontested. I will skip now the example from the Midrash, yeah? Just let's translate this one. Yeah. But what was so dangerous about Metatron's elevation to the lesser god? Scholarly, scholars normally resort to the danger inflicted on Judaism as a monotheistic religion. This is true enough, but what precisely does it mean? As I mentioned at the beginning of my lecture, monotheism is a notoriously vague category that has never been monolithic and easy to define, neither in the Hebrew Bible nor in the subsequent Jewish tradition. And I believe we can go a step further. Metatron was elevated by God to the highest angel in heaven, superior to all the other angels, and sharing with God all the divine attributes, such as name, size, throne, wisdom, and so forth. Okay. And as some of you may have guessed already, there is only one other figure on whom similar qualities are lavished, and this figure is Jesus Christ. And indeed, some scholars have invested great effort into discovering some kind of heavenly macroanthropos, huge man, in the Second Temple period that prefigured the New Testament Jesus and that might be connected with Jewish speculations that came fully to force in the third book of Enoch. Others, most notably Daniel Boyarin, wish to go a step further and see in Metatron a representative of the so-called Binitarian theology, that is, a theology within the very heart of early pre-Christian Judaism that develops the notion of two divine powers sharing among them the divinity, most prominently the hypostasized wisdom and logos. It is not the place here to discuss Jewish Binitarianism, but whereas there can be no doubt in my view that pre-Christian Judaism, and not only Philo, was indeed sympathetic to such ideas, and that the Christian adaption of wisdom and logos speculations put an end to this sympathy, I do not think that Metatron belongs to this illustrious company. The title Adonai Hakatan is unique, and I emphasize, is unique to the third book of Enoch and needs to be explained first and foremost within the parameter, parameters of the historical setting of the third book of Enoch. Unless one wants to claim that this particular tradition is much older than the rest of the material collected in three Enoch, which would be very difficult to say the least, or to conjure up the chimera of phenomenological versus historical evidence. If we take the rather late date of the third book of Enoch, again, 6th, 7th century CE, seriously, and do not ignore the chronological and geographic setting of this book, as I said before, chronologically, three Enoch belongs to the post-Talmudic period and geographically, most likely to Babylonia. The most obvious point of reference is clearly the New Testament. There is every reason to believe that the Babylonian Jews knew the New Testament, either directly through the diatessaron, that is the harmony of the four gospels composed by Tatian, presumably in Syriac, or the New Testament Pshitta, the Syriac translation of the four separate gospels, or indirectly through the medium of Syrian church fathers 
such as Afrahat or Ephraim. After all, the, the Syriac and Babylonian Aramaic are closely related Aramaic dialects. Hence, I would like to turn the tables and suggest that instead of seeing three Enochs Metatron as part of the fabric from which the New Testament Jesus emerged, we try to understand the figure of Metatron as an answer to the New Testament's message of Jesus Christ. In this context, Guy Strumza has drawn our attention to the famous hymn in Paul's letter to the Philippians, where it is said of Jesus, I quote, that he, Philippians chapter 2, that he, Jesus, though he was in the form of God and more did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him his name that is above every name, so that in, at the name of Jesus, every knee should, be, should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If we, <coughs> if we read this text in light of the Metatron traditions in Three Enoch, some striking parallels become apparent and some less conspicuous differences. Christ, though conceived of in the form of God, did not insist on his equality with God, but rather assumed the form of a servant or slave, and hence of a human being. After he died, God exalted him, that is, raised him from the dead, gave him the name above every name, whereupon all heavenly and earthly beings worshipped him and acknowledged him as the Lord. The movement here is from the top down, from Christ's divine existence to his human form, and then again from bottom up, from his human existence back to his original divine form. The latter movement is caused by God, exalting Jesus after his death and bestowing on him the most powerful name that is the name of the Lord. In Metatron's case, there's only one movement from the bottom up. He begins as a human being that, however, does not die, but is exalted by God to heaven to assume there his angelic and almost divine function as God's deputy and viceroy, appearing in the form and with the attributes of God, bearing God's name and worshipped by the angels. Ironically, it is in this state that he is called, Metaton, together with the name of God, servant, like Jesus in the letter. Hence, despite the similarities, the Metatron tradition suggests a dramatic reversal of the New Testament narrative. <clears throat> we do have a God-like figure, it posits, but this figure did not first originate in heaven and then relinquish its divinity in order to become human. On the contrary, this figure was fully human and chosen by God to be transformed into a divine being and to assume its function as God's servant and as the judge of angels and humans alike. Another noticeable parallel appears in the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. I quote, he, Jesus, is a reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he, has, when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Here, Jesus is conceived as God's reflection and hypothesis. 
who returns to his divine origin after having purified humanity from their sins. Upon his return to heaven, God assigns to him a throne next to him and a special name, the name of God. Both these qualities mark him as superior to all the angels. And the text continues to stress precisely this superiority. God calls him alone, my son. The angels are asked to worship him. His throne is forever. He will remain forever, and he is asked to sit at God's right hand. The analogies and differences are very similar to those in the letter to the Philippians, though with a closer parallel here between Jesus and Metatron's superiority to the angels. I'm coming to the last paragraph. So one could ultimately argue that Metatron indeed adopts the role of Jesus Christ, yet without the mythical and, for the Jewish reader, unacceptable package deal of Jesus' divine origin and human birth, that alone is crucial death on the cross. The savior quality of that divine figure, so dominant in the New, in the New Testament, is no doubt also present in the Metatron tradition. Metatron knows and apparently judges all the secrets in the hearts of his former fellow humans on earth. The function of Metatron obviously stands in tension to the traditional role of the Messiah. But this tension in the third book of Enoch seems to be deliberate. So to speak, the third book of Enoch wants to have it both ways the traditional messianic expectation as well as Metatron's new role. To some extent, Metatron's powerful figure in Three Enoch, responding, as I propose, to the Christian message, completes and concludes the movement of what we call the Merkava mystics, the earliest manifestation of Jewish mysticism, namely, the ascent to heaven of some individuals has become unnecessary, or rather was replaced by that unique human being who ascended to heaven and then did not return but stayed there with God forever. With Metatron in heaven, there is no longer any need to send human beings up to heaven to assure the earthly community of God's continual love for Israel. Not unlike the Christians, Three Enoch claims, we now have our own representative forever in heaven to take care of us, a savior who is one of us, true man and new God. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you very much, my translator.